Good morning, everybody. I think we're going to make a start now. At this very civilised hour, I've decided that I'll have to mandate that no conference starts before 10 a.m. in the morning. So on behalf of all of us here at the Prato Centre, I want to extend a very warm welcome both to the centre but also to the city of Prato. I suspect for some of you at least, this is your first time with us and perhaps even your first time visiting Prato. If you haven't been here before, I hope the weather won't discourage you from at least spending some time exploring the city. There are some wonderful and very important sites that I think are often overlooked, so I do encourage you to, to go out into the city. The Monash Prato Centre was established in 2001, which means that we will shortly be entering our 17th year of operation. I know that probably is relatively young still compared to many of the institutions that are represented in this room. But for a university that itself is less than 60 years old, it's actually a pretty significant achievement. So Monash Prato has been part of the Monash story for almost a third of the university's existence. Our model here is somewhat different from some of the other programs in Italy. For the most part, we teach in intensive mode for credit programs. So while you can spend a semester with us here in Prato, most of our students are here for shorter periods of time. I think this flexibility has been important for us to be able to establish our position as a resource for the entire university, not just for a select number of disciplines in the humanities. So over the course of the year, our courses range from IT, engineering, business, law, as well as history, culture, language, as you might have expected. True to the founding mission, I think, of the university, we prioritise being deeply embedded in the local community. Our Faculty of Education students have just finished doing a teaching round in the local schools in Prato, and I think these sorts of initiatives really characterise the way the city has welcomed and embraced us. I think probably you already have a sense of how fortunate we are in our physical location here in Palazzo Vai. Over the years, we've even become quite attached to some of the more questionable architectural elements <laughs> that characterise the 1950s fit out. And I hope you enjoy discovering them as you move around the building as well. I recommend a little trip behind the curtains here for some of the prize pieces. Palazzo Vai continues to hold, I think, a very special place in the imagination of the Pratesi, not just as the former family palace of the Vai family, but also as the seat of the society of the Misordoli. The Misordoli were a recreational club that occupied this building for over 100 years, and we have much of its current appearance to thank them for. Many local people here still recall with great affection the balls, the dinners, the concerts that took place in this very room, and some of them also the gambling and card games that continued late into the night in some of the other rooms. So while I don't think Peter is going to issue us with any gambling chips, I do hope you enjoy your time here with us in Palazzo Vai. I do want to conclude by offering my congratulations to the conference organisers, to Peter, Jonathan, Freddie and John in putting together such a distinguished group of scholars and what looks to be a really fascinating program. So welcome. Good morning. It remains to echo Cecilia's welcome to all of you to this conference and to thank you for venturing from Florence and elsewhere to be with us for this uh, exciting couple of days, which were well inaugurated yesterday evening by John Henderson with his uh, Bill Kent Memorial Lecture. To give a context to the conference, um, it is in a larger framework, a, a research project and program undertaken by the Faculty of Arts back at Monash in Melbourne. We're fortunate in the area of medieval Renaissance studies to have a dedicated program, The Body in the City. And that, that program has a number of cl research clusters, one of which is health and healthscaping, and it's under that 
research cluster that this conference falls. The overall Body in the City project has attracted a great deal of attention and recently gained its own publishing platform with Routledge. The Body in the City's inauguration was at the Renaissance Society of America conference in Boston 2015, and that was fortuitous. One of the initial conversations garnered by that uh, inauguration was a conversation between Jonathan Nelson and John Henderson. A feasibility workshop was convened here at Prato almost exactly a year ago. The result was the conference we're enjoying over these days. And I echo Cecilia's comment for the intellectual leadership. Particular thanks go to uh, John Henderson, Jonathan Davies, uh, Jonathan Nelson. Why did I do that slip? And um, Freddie Jackal. So, without further ado, it is with, with great pleasure that I introduce Evelyn Welsh as our opening speaker this morning. Evelyn is Provost and Senior Vice President, Arts and Sciences at King's College London. She has led a range of major, substantially funded research programs, including the Material Renaissance and her current Welcome Program, uh, Welcome Trust Project on Renaissance Skin. Her publications are extensive and important, covering a range of topics on European art and material culture. And most recently, um, um, we can all be grateful for fashioning the early modern dress textiles, innovation in Europe, 1500 to 1800, Oxford University Press, 2017. So uh, without further ado, please welcome Evelyn to the podium. I think you may still have the clicker. Oh, there it is. Lovely. Thank you very much for that um, kind introduction. And can I say thank you so much to the organizers for the invitation and a special shout out for the team back in Monash who have been spectacular at organizing all the transport and arrangements. It's much appreciated. On October 26th, 1626, the Medici envoy to Mantua, Alessandro Baldelli Bartolini, wrote to his counterpart in Florence, Di Murgo Lombardi, to inform him that, I quote, the news arrived very unexpectedly that his most illustrious Grand Duke, our Lord, Ferdinand II de' Medici, um, who was an adolescent at this point, has been taken ill with smallpox. And their highnesses are taking great consolation in knowing that he is progressing well and that things are moving forward happily. A year later, however, while it was clear that the young duke had recovered, he no longer resembled his former self. Another letter from Florence from October 22nd, 1627, this time to the Duchess of Mantua herself, explained that, again I quote, Giusto Pittore, that is used to Sustermans, presently has the portrait of His Excellency in his hands, but he hasn't worked on it since he had smallpox. When it is done, he will make a copy for Your Excellency and will send it to you. Madama, that is Ferdinando Secunda's mother, Christine de Lorraine, would have made a copy of one that she has, but it is from before he became ill with smallpox and is very different from how he is today. Now, this brief correspondence is not only a record of one of the most common and increasingly deadly illnesses in Western Europe, it is also linked to a remarkable visual record. An artist, probably Sustermans himself, took the picture he'd been working on, which you see here, um, and used it to do a time series, if you like, of how the face and skin of the young Grand Duke had changed over time. Now, only two panels from um, two different, from the sixth day here, and the ninth day here survive. Um, and it's probable that there were more. 
And while their precise purpose is unclear, the fascination with the development of the characteristic smallpox pustules as they emerge over this 10-day period or so is very obvious there. And indeed, the attention that was paid not only to the development of the pustules, but also to the treatment um, of the Grand Duke can be seen as well in the red clothing that he's wearing there. Um, red, uh, red treatment, the covering of the patient in red garments, red cloth, um, was a very standard part of treatments recommended by Arabic doctors such as Razes, whose work on, I quote, a treatment of the smallpox and measles was translated from Arabic into Latin in Venice in 1498, and by Averroes, who described the need to use red medicinally there. But above all, this image is an image of recovery. As those of you um, who work on the humeral body will be aware, it's extraordinarily important that the corrupted matter inside the body emerge and escape to the outside of the body. So the coming up of the pustules now is actually the moment of salvation there. So much so that in fact, if they don't come, um, if the pus does not emerge there, doctors recommended that you go and actually break open the pustules themselves there. Um, and as such, it really needs to be seen in the same light as this medallion, which was struck to commemorate Queen Elizabeth's recovery from um, smallpox there, where the San Paolari who sells St. Paul's Earth against poison are referenced here in the snake who touches her um, hand but actually has no impact there. So far from being, if you like, a record, an accurate record of smallpox and its medical history there, this is actually probably as much in the ex voto side of things as it is in the recording side. Um, and that's important because actually real images of smallpox, which ravaged much of Italy um, in the 16th and 17th century, here you see the pitted face of an uh, Aragonese mummy here showing you the devastation that it actually occurs in the surface of the body here, is very rarely referenced in this period. As indeed, and um, PowerPoint is a wonderful thing. You can gather together all of the images you have of diseased and deformed um, faces to make it look like they're lots. But actually, apart from this Holbein and Ghirlandaio, which I'm showing you here, they're very rare indeed. Italians and others preferred to be portrayed with smooth, pox-free faces there. So, most of the imagery that um, we look at when we think about imagining infirmity there show um, images for reasons other than imaging infirmity to display, for example, caritas there, charity, as in the Ospedale in Siena there, um, to excite you about innovations and novelties here. Uh, this print of the use of guaiacum, or holy wood there, against syphilis, is part of a print series, again um, associated with Sussumans there, which um, displays um, the way that holy wood is um, used here, is made up and then used as a treatment, as part of a series of prints in the Nova Reperta, new things that were discovered from the new world there. So its image here is not, if you like, to sell you this treatment, but to tell you about innovations and novelties that have come from the new world that you may not know about there. And actually it's quite interesting to see the picture within the picture. You can just make out, this is a scene of merrymaking over here with the man taking a woman to bed there, obviously leading now to the need for treatment for syphilis there. So it's a moralizing text as well as a text designed to excite interest there. 
And finally, in this scene of the death of Francesca Tornaboni there, they're also designed to invite pity or invite emulation there. And here, of course, the mourning figures tell you how to respond to this particular image there. Um, so what I want to do in this talk is focus, as Sheila will after me there, on how we're invited to see infirmity, what tropes and techniques are used to invite us to imagine what is going on within the body there. Um, most of the imagery that do with the interior and exterior of the body is very much associated with text there. So these images of where and how to bleed, for example, both in manuscript and in print there, could be described as instructional there. They're kept within the book itself there. Um, or here in these two examples here, uh, telling you either the techniques of bleeding from the tongue here, or in this um, late 16th century printed book there, showing you new forms of scarification of the leg um, that are used in Egypt there. So the text and the image very importantly coincide there. You are told through words how to respond and use the images themselves there. But in this talk, I want to concentrate on a single sheet print without any words, where the viewer, whether in the 16th century or today, has to understand both what is going on and how to respond to it there. Um, this is quite an unusual image. It's unusual for a number of reasons there. The first of which is that um, we actually do know something about it. In 1586, towards the end of his short biography of the 16th century Mantuan artist, Giulio Romano, Giorgio Vasari listed images of the reproductions of the master's works that he had seen. And of these, there are engravings to be seen, executed by Giovanni Battista Mantovano, who had engraved a vast number of things drawn by Giulio. And in particular, beside three drawings of battles engraved by others, a physician who is applying cupping glasses to the shoulders of a woman, which is what you see here. And we'll come back to the issue of why he discusses this as being a woman in a moment there. Um, remarkably, um, this has been little noticed either by art or medical historians, but the inclusion is striking for its unusual subject matter. Cupping, which involved placing heated glass, bone, or metal wares on the skin to create a vacuum, was a long-standing traditional form of treatment for a wide range of diseases from antiquity onwards. But while, as we'll see, it had been illustrated in manuscripts and in some printed books, it was primarily shown for the purpose of explaining how and where to cite cups properly, and very occasionally to inspire amusement. But as Vasari describes it, however, this was an image that was designed for observation and reflection rather than for education. This is an image intended to be seen, not to be used there. Um, a range of versions of this image survive. This is attributed to the Bolognese artist working in Fontainebleau, Antonio Fantuzzi, here. Um, and a later version by Giorgio Ghisi, um, which takes this middle scene here. This is also attributed now to Giorgio Ghisi, but from the 1530s, this from the 1560s there. So it's being used and reused over time there. Um, in looking at this, and indeed how it moves from being a classicizing formulation of this scene to much more of a genre scene there, and tracing the image and its multiple permutations allows us to consider ways in which traditional medical and surgical practices were reformulated both in classical guise and in contemporary scenes there. 
And in exploring this print and others depicting 16th century medical interventions, both traditional and novel, allows us both to raise questions about how a very ancient practice was reformulated for a Renaissance audience and how interventions such as cupping were reimagined in print as part of new interventions in the art market there. So we can ask how these visually arresting set of single sheet images reconstruct the notion of interior and exterior. What is it that we're actually seeing? What is it that we're being invited to feel about our own bodies there? So uh, just to give you some details there, just to show you some of the differences, uh, they're, they're quite minor, but telling up here, for example, there's a clister which is missing over here. Um, again, you can see some details. And in the later Gizi print, it's much more domesticated there. There's a plate of, chicken, of fowls here um, and some discarded sandals there. So um, let me just spend a few minutes talking about where this image comes from there, uh, which is unfortunately not as straightforward as I would like there. Um, the origins of the Gizi engraving that Giorgio Vasari described came from a very private space originally designed for the Duke of Mantua, Federico II Gonzaga there. At some point in the early 1530s, Giulio Romano in his workshop painted a set of frescoes in the loggia of the so-called Giardino Segreto. And you can just see this is the fresco here. And it's a relatively faithful transcription, probably not of the fresco, but of an intermediary drawing there. And this is the space, that's the wall fresco there. And you can just see over here there's a cupping scene and over here there's a birth scene. It's quite a complex set of imagery um, which I don't have time to discuss now. But from the late 19th century onwards, this cycle has been described as a scene of the human life cycle and little attention has been paid to deciphering what is clearly a much more complex story there. Again, you can just make out in the, the vault of the Logetta there. Um, <coughs> by 1530, um, the scene here had been translated into the first Gizi print, and by 1540, uh, many of the other scenes had been also translated by Gizi in from fresco into print there. And the thing that we just need to notice here is that by this point, either Gizi or his publisher decided that no one could possibly understand what's going on here. So this Diana of Ephesus figure here has her breasts removed there and a plaque is added here down below to say that this is the birth of Memnon, the son of the goddess Aurora, whom you can see over here. The point being that whatever the original intentions of the original iconography, by 20, 30 years after its commissioning, nobody really knew, certainly if you were just looking at the drawings for it, what was going on in this cycle. It had become sufficiently detached from its origins to become a birth scene of a classicizing nature there. And that indeed is also what has happened to this second version of the Gizi print there. This scene here is singled out here and all of what must have been original classicizing references are removed there. Um, and the most important cross-referencing that takes place is very much in the morning figure who lies at the front of the bed there. So what would you then have seen, what would you have understood if you purchased this print in 1540 there. Um, what would you have imagined was going on? Because actually, if you know nothing about the practices involved here, you might think it's a bunch of pebbles on this person's shoulder blades here. What is actually 
taking place. But the practice of cupping, as I've said, is very ancient and quite ubiquitous there. Um, I don't have time to run through all of the examples, just one, Celsius on medicine, a form of a cup may be made, not only of the above materials, but of anything suitable. A small drinking cup or a porridge bowl can be used. This is a very domestic form of ancient intervention there. If the skin upon which the cup is to be stuck is cut beforehand with a scalpel, the cup extracts blood. When the skin is intact, wind. So the whole process of cupping is a form of extraction, of deep extraction, of the ability of the doctor, surgeon, or practitioner to intervene deep within the body through surface manipulation here. Here is Galen on a method of medicine there. Um, uh, who long discussion about whether or not you place the cups actually on the place of affliction or further away from it so that you actually draw the poisons or corrupted matter from one part of the body to another part of the body here. Um, it's necessary to evacuate the whole body beforehand. Whatever part of the head you might place the cupping glasses on, you will fill the whole head with blood there. So quite a lot of descriptions of where to place it, how to dislodge corrupted matter there. Um, and then it moves into, very swiftly, into Arabic medicine there. Cupping glasses applied to the buttocks, as we will see in a moment, drag out afflictions from the entire body, from the head to the intestines, and heal the corruption of menstrual blood and in this way relieve the body there. Again, I don't have time to go through the many examples in the 16th century in which cupping is described, but I do want to stress that it's particularly associated with problems of menstruation there, which is possibly why when Vasari sees this image there, he sees a woman there rather than the figure who actually is potentially either male or female, as we will see when we have a final look at the image itself there. But um, actually stopping or starting menstruation is very much part of what cupping is supposed to do there. Um, and we go into um, Ambroise Paré there, uh, who, um, and we'll come on to him in a moment there, but the use of cupping, and I'm going to be showing some uh, northern European examples here, is not specifically associated with any particular type of practitioner in the period that I'm describing there. Um, and in northern Europe is above all associated as a female practice. This is a 15th century John of Arden manuscript from England, just showing you a few um, examples of cupping practices done by women, both to men and to women here. Um, and then there are numerous, and each one of these images is complex and needs to be understood within the context of the print culture in which it sits. Um, but generally, in Northern European examples, this is a late 15th century calendar. This is Host Amen's um, Book of Trades here they're associated with bathhouses there. And, and here you can actually see this is a calendar text that says that this is a practice that you should do whether you're ill or well there. So it's actually part of your regimen for health, not necessarily an intervention that you do at the point of medical crisis there. Um, another late, sorry, early 17th century example and here, a book on ophthalmology, um, because cupping is particularly good for eye diseases here. Um, two more examples, Ambroise Paré here, um, and another, this is Ambroise Paré's introduction of the scarifier there, which is used to um, cut through the skin quickly before applying um, the second version of the cup there. Here's another scarifier from the 17th century. 
Okay, so to come back to the print itself, I hope now that you can see that with this mental map of what cupping is, um, that you might actually see this figure as female there, because particularly it's going down onto the buttocks there. And that when we get to this point, the focus, the drama of this moment when you're about to create the vacuum there, how do you actually get this to stick to the body in a way that it doesn't come off there? And it's this moment of drama um, which I would argue that we need to look at. And thinking in terms of what Michael Baxendorf taught us to think about in terms of the period I, start thinking of the period body there because this print is indeed a deposit of social relationships there. It's a deposit of the relationship um, between the publisher, the engraver, and the purchaser, but it's also a deposit of the relationship between the viewer and their understanding of what is just about to happen. And this figure here tells us that this is no ordinary moment. This is no typical regimen. This is no part of day-to-day -day medical care. This is a moment of crisis. Will this intervention succeed? Will this new heroic figure, isolated in the center, actually achieve what is so desired? That is, the movement of corruption within to without there. So as we go through the rest of today's conference, I hope we can start thinking about how between the history of medicine and the history of art, we actually come to reconsider the history of the body as it was in the Renaissance. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Evelyn, for that stimulating lecture and presentation. Um, according to your program, you'll see that we're having discussion after each set of papers. So um, hold those questions in your mind, write them down, don't lose them. And hopefully it will turn into a conversation, not simply a question and answer session. So we can sort of conceive of this time as a type of workshop where we're all able to engage. So please allow me to introduce our second speaker this morning, Sheila Barker. Sheila directs the Jane Fortune Research Program on Women Artists at the Medici Archive Project. She's published on a range of topics, including plague and art in Rome. And we're about to be enlightened by some of her latest work. And uh, I do ask you to welcome Sheila to the podium. Thanks, Sheila. I'd like to extend an emphatic thank you to the organizers um, for all the work behind the scenes, but also um, for the opportunity